Derek Hamill would postpone the start of the race when his car came to a stop down on the apron in turns three and four. An electrical issue already for the lift machine. That crew's got some work to do. It's pole position for Matthew Engelram in the number 47 Menard Chevy. It's been a rough couple of rounds for the driver, falling from second all the way down to ninth in the standings. This is one of his last shots to really get back into the points race. Jim Gambit in the number 44 continues his very strong record of qualifying this season. He's second best in the field, only to his brother, John Gambit. The Gambit's always lightning quick, but Jim was not very good on that start. Nick Pericles is going to slip into second as Engelram easily takes lead heading down into turns three and four. We got a wreck behind these guys and we're already under yellow as we come across to finish lap one. Mifuni Sanjuro started dead last after spinning during his qualifying run. He's already on the move trying to get by drivers like Tony Green and Jake Baskinger. Mifuni pushes hard into turns three. Tristan Wilhoit into the wall in front of these guys. A little bit of a sack up as a result. Sanjuro tried to get on the brakes there, but they were already on cold tires, especially from Hamill stalling on the apron, preventing this race from starting at its scheduled time. And Sanjuro would slide up the track, getting some damage along with Tony Green, who suffered a 15-spot grid penalty, putting him back to 40th in the danger zone for that race start. Engelram with a very weak restart. Nick Pericles looks to the outside but can't make anything of it. Jim Gambit trying to snap away second and he'll get it off of turn number two. Looking on the Menard Chevy for the lead. Jim Gambit does not have a heck of a lot of laps led despite his very good qualifying efforts so far this season. But he cannot get anything to work on the inside of turns three and four. There's less banking down there and the asphalt is a little rougher and so Engelram will pull out to a three car length lead. It's been a while since Annie Thomas was in race two but Thomas not getting off to a good start getting up into the wall so so easy to get up into the grass and after that she was pinned to the outside it wasn't really helped along by Ali Nelson and this is stacked up the field around the points leader DJ Curtis this is not what Curtis wants to see as they nearly wreck behind them my goodness Van Evenhoven and King got together let's take another look at that. Scott Roush comes up a bit off the corner, gets into Van Evenhoven, who quickly becomes a pinball. An amazing save by the 81 to get that car straightened out without uh, taking out one of his fellow competitors. Van Evenhoven shoving the 696 a bit low there down the front straight. Uh, don't blame the 81 for being a bit frustrated, but this has really stacked up the field. The midfield battle definitely has their fans on their feet today. On board Tyler Thaber here, he's got Annie Thomas to his outside, Torres slips up the middle, but Thaber with a very good run off the corner, throws it through the inside as they were four wide for a second there. Thaber, no holds barred despite the warning he received at Devil's Bowl. Gambit, nose to nose with the number 47 heading into three and four, Engelram shoves the 44 down the track a little bit into the corner. And Gambit cannot hold the momentum. He will fall back into the clutches of Collins and Skyla Johnson. This could be a particularly good day for Johnson if she can stay where she is. She came into this race eighth in points. And uh, a good run, like a podium effort or even a top five, could put her right back into the championship hunt. Mark Hankins also looking good so far this race. He came into this race in the top five in points after his second place finish to his brother back at Devil's Bowl. Currently in this gaggle. Oh, Duncan's in the wall. Little John and Hankins swerve to avoid. They get together and the seven spins to the outside. Oh, man, there were some close calls there, especially with Baskinger and our points leader, DJ Curtis. Hankins gets that car turned around safely somehow. He's still driving it. A lot of rear end damage and probably some big disappointment for the seven team. I'm not sure whether that car is going to be competitive if he can keep it on track. The racing up here was already pretty hectic and Hankins had nowhere to go when he swerved to avoid the number 83. The 30 was diving down low trying to make a three wide pass between Fullerton and the number seven and that gap closed up in a real hurry. Little John gets the most damage of uh, these guys, other than the seven, of course, but it should be nothing that the Wiley Short Track veteran can't handle. 
On the race back to the line, Jim Gambit hounding the number 47 through turns three and four, gets into the number 47 there off the corner. The 47 manages to save it and comes to the line to take the yellow. That was a very close call between the two of them. And the 44 gets up alongside the 47 and bumps him in the tire there. Not sure if there's some sort of bad blood between the two. The 47 hasn't exactly been the kindest to Gambit out there on the racetrack. We are still early on, but uh, Angle Ram's going for it today, and I don't think Gambit's taken to it too kindly. A much better restart this time around for Matthew Engelram. He's led every single lap so far this race. Complete dominance so far by the Menards machine. Goes down low to protect from a challenge from Jim Gambit, but this could give Skylar Johnson a big run off the corner. Skylar Johnson slips into second temporarily, but is stuck on the outside through turns one and two, where the inside line is pre pre preferred, and Jim Gambit slips back into second. Alexander Rowe with a tire down on the number 36 when we came to the restart as he swerves that car around trying to keep that car stable down on the apron but it's so hard when there's a lot of banking on a track like this. Tristan Wilhoyt into the back of the 36 as Rowe tries to get that car down to pit road. He's going to be successful but that was some close calls there with the rest of the field. Jim Gambit finally with a better run off of turn number four. He challenges the 47 to the inside. This is where he might be able to get it done. Dives it hard and low through turns one and number two. And Gambit will snap the lead away from the number 47. Kyle Collins now attacking the 47. Trying to sweep up in front of the 47 but can't do so. Engelram back around the outside. But Gambit with his first lap led today. Sukuli and Engritz get together there. Engritz just barely tapping the number two, and Sukuli with a miraculous save there manages to continue on unscathed. Mark Hankins really struggling with that damaged race car. He gets into the wall back there, and he will lose a lot of time. I think at this point he's just hoping for some more attrition. DJ Curtis currently in the middle of a three-wide battle for 26th position. Not where a lot of people expected him to be in this race, especially considering he won on his only former start. But today, hasn't been able to get into a rhythm, and he's currently stuck between a bunch of guys that seem to have a magnetic attraction for accidents. Guys like Ali Nelson, Sebastian Torres, John King, and Jerry Guerra. Jim Gambit challenged on the inside by Kyle Collins in the number 48. Runs it up high. Matthew Engelram forces him to stay at the top side of the track. Kyle Collins doing his best to try and make the pass. And it's Collins going to be leading at, at the line. Surprisingly good run onto the front straightaway despite not being at the top side of the circuit. Collins has got a strong car today in the Musco lighting machine. But he always seems to be up front this year. Just can't bring home a W so far. Matthew Engelram slips back into second. As Carlin Dumian joins the top five fray. DJ Curtis slides up the track. Jerry Guerra makes some contact with him there. Guerra, a miraculous save for him off of turn number four. That car was probably 20 degrees to the corner there. And he will hold on. Hopefully no tire down on the number 33 as we continue on. Oh my goodness. John King with a horrible accident. Just in front of the group we were monitoring. Ali Nelson would catch John King in a weird spot there, making contact with the 19, who would hit the inside wall just to spear into the outside of the pit wall there. A brutal hit as John King would come to a stop in Henrietta Fitzwater's pit box. We're going to need to take another look at that. Hopefully, John King's going to be all right here. Yeah, John King just within an unfortunate situation there. Just when he had saved the car, he suddenly had to make a big decision about where to go and... Man, brutal, brutal crash for John King. We're going to have to look at this one in slow motion. Watching in slow motion from John King's perspective, he gets clipped by Nelson there off the corner. Gets sent down to the inside, desperately trying to save the car. Now on the flat surface, I'm sure. Now, Just now he gets the car saved. Seems to commit to going down pit lane. Misjudges it just a little bit there. Clips the wall down by the official and hard into the end of the pit wall there. A brutal, brutal hit for John King, possibly one of the worst crashes of the season. One last angle from the edge of pit road, John King sent engine first into the end of the pit wall there. He actually beat Ali Nelson 
to turn number three. Telemetry tells us that he was still going 95 miles an hour, and that car impacted twice, once with the end of the pit wall there, and then that car was swung um, tail left first into the outside of the pit wall a few feet further along. The red flag was brought out for this crash as uh, we wish John King all the best in any recovery that he may need. Hopefully we'll get a medical update on him in the not too distant future. Bit of a somber restart here as Kyle Collins brings the field back to the line, the Musco machine, uh, with a fairly decent restart, but Angle Ram's running him down a little bit off of turn number two. It's going to stick right behind the number 48 for now. Jim Gambit, with a very weak entry into turns one and two, is going to lose a spot to Henry Williams, Skyla Johnson, and Sam Curtis racing for hard for position. Johnson squeezing Curtis down the track, and they make some contact there. I'm sure if Jeffrey Fingai is going to have something to say about that, especially considering Sam Curtis is the teammate to the championship leader, DJ Curtis. But in any case, Skyla Johnson holds on to the position for now. Matthew Engelram, alongside the number 48, dives it into turn number three and manages to get in front of the slow car of Alexander Rowe. Clearly there is something uh, more than just a tire down wrong with the Motec machine as Kyle Collins gets used as a pick here and no one is going to cut him any slack as we approach the halfway mark of this race, especially for the top ten positions. Kyle Collins going to lose about a dozen spots in all of that. Jim Gambit has been getting some terrific runs off of turn number four, and just as we saw earlier, he's going to get by Matthew Engelram down the front straightaway. Engelram has nowhere to go to defend that maneuver, and Gambit and the Cornflakes machine back on by. Sam Curtis follows him through, and now Curtis trying to work on the number 44 for the race lead, despite some very strong performances by Sam so far this year. He has yet to lead a single lap. Engelram challenging down low, dives it hard through turns three and four, trying to come up in front of the 44, but can't quite do it as Gambit gets a good run off the corner to continue leading this race, denying Engelram a lap lead. That'll be a short-lived success, it looks like, though, as the 47 slips by through turns one and two, and now he's got um, more cars to deal with in the form of Henry Williams in the 8HW, Sam Curtis, and Nick Pericles sitting there waiting for... Uh, an opportunity to open up. Caution is out. Matthew Engelram, the new race leader. It feels like the backfield of the track has been itching for a wreck of this entire race, and Alexander Rowe, the slow car to the outside, just acted as a catalyst. Engris got into the 34, who speared back up the track into the wall and over the wall for the second time this year. Derek Hamill has gone over the wall. He's the only driver to do so, and somehow he's done it twice. Hamill will come to rest on his roof down in the turn three grass. Derek Hamill actually had the least to gain of any of the drivers in this battle. He's a, he was stuck a lap down and was the only car one lap down because of his the issues he faced at the start of this race. Contact with Engritz there. Hamill was not quite able to save it as well as other drivers had earlier on. There was less room to do so because they were four wide and off the track he went. One last look from turn three here as Derek Hamill really has a top to stop taking that lift sponsorship so literally. Uh, man's really got to think about starting a skateboarding career at this point. Matthew Engelram, a great jump on the restart there. Jim Gambit really failed to move on the start and Henry Williams is going to easily slip on through into second. Gambit trying to protect uh, from getting overtaken by Nick Pericles for that final podium spot but the Time is running out, and Nick Pericles seemed to run the 44 all the way up to the outside. To no avail, though. Gambit stays in third. Annie Thomas and PJ Williams make some contact right beside the points leader. Nice save by Annie Thomas to get that car pointed in the right direction and make turn number three. Not even going to lose too many spots from that, but Al Lagasy not cutting her a whole lot of slack on the bottom of the track there. Very tight race going on at the barrier for top 10 entry. Mike Viznovsky, Sidney Krasa, Henrietta Fitzwater, and Skyla Johnson, just for good measure, uh, throws it into turn three, racing for that spot. Some contact between the 29 and the 21, but that's just short track racing. Johnson's going to make the pass on the 21 ultimately as the 23 and the 61 continue uh, to try and move forward. 
Henry Williams trying on the inside of Matthew Engelram, but it takes time to learn how to pass Matthew Engelram. It looks like as Williams, as we saw with Gambit several times earlier on, is forced to get back into line. P.J. Williams and Andy Thomas still going at it. This time it's Jake Baskinger turning the 93 down the track a little bit. Thomas again saves it. I think she's getting used to that inside line down in turns three and four. Man, someone stopped bullying the number 93 there. As the 24 loses a few spots further up, I think he got into the wall himself. And just like Jim Gambit, Henry Williams has found Matthew Engelram's weakness. Gets a good run off of turn number four and slips by the number 47. I think we'll see Engelram challenge the number eight back in just a moment. Kyle Collins and Nick Pericles racing for third. And Engelram, here he goes with the crossover off of turn four. He's figured out the strategy. And to the inside he goes through turns one and two. Henry Williams giving him lots of space. I think he's trying to just slip in behind the 47. Almost isn't able to do so and nearly makes some contact with the 48 and the 84. Laps are running down. Tensions beginning to run a little bit high here. There's a textbook definition of a gaggle in front of Christian Hartono right now. He's been delegated to the mid-twenties for most of the day. Will Hoyt clips Fullerton, and Hartono slides up into Will Hoyt himself. Both of those guys into the wall, and Carter gets a piece as well. Williams managed to snap the lead away from Engelram, coming to the caution flag, and so the AC Delco machine leads the field back to the green flag. Engelram with a much better restart than the 8HW. It's a, it was a pretty weak one overall, really. Kept the field really stacked up next to him, but so far he's succeeding in the 8HW. Engelram didn't go for a move off of turn two, surprisingly, but instead goes for a charge through turns three and four, and that will carry him by the 8HW in turn one. Kyle Collins got great momentum on both of them. He will slip into second in the Musco lighting machine. That car looking pretty lit in these final few laps. Sam Curtis and Nick Pericles still drivers to watch as Jim Gamut tries to get himself back in the mix as well. Kyle Collins snaps the lead away from Matthew Engelram there as Engelram with a terrible turns one and two. Might come under attack from Henry Williams as well. Williams trying to slip up in front of the 47. Leaves the door open though on the top side of the track. The 8HW might have been focusing a little bit too much on Sam Curtis, but he keeps that inside the important inside line through turns one and two. Kyle Collins has been very strong as a race leader. He's kind of thinned out the top five, actually. It's mostly just the 48 and the 8 running nose to tail. Sam Curtis is getting back into the mix, but Matthew Engelram seeming to have some troubles sticking with these guys. Generally, no pit stops required, but you wonder if Engelram might have used up his stuff too early on. Kyle Collins looks awfully hard to beat. He has four top fives to his name so far this season. He's come close to victories on many occasions. Could this finally be the day? Tyler Faber, a slow lap car right in front of him. Got about 10 laps to go at this point. Faber, being a gracious back marker, drops to the inside. I think Faber's getting used to this at this point. And Collins continues with the race lead. He's opened up a three car length gap over Henry Williams. Prudence Littlejohn in the wall on the outside there. She has fallen all the way from outside the top 10 into the mid-20s in the second half of the race. But Joshua Sikuli blows an engine at the bottom of the track. It was apparently a transmission failure, and that's going to cap off a disappointing weekend for the Sikuli team. Kyle Collins now under significant pressure from the 8HW, tries to dive it low to protect against any um, big moves in turn number three but as a result slides up the track and ends up having to get on the brakes a little bit to avoid the steel girder on the outside of the circuit that opens the door for the 8hw of henry williams to go on back by sam curtis tried his best to follow him through but isn't able to do so at the moment Battle for the lead, but also a battle for third, and an unexpected one at that. The Mr. Submachine of Henrietta Fitzwater is up into fourth spot from starting 41st on the grid. An incredible display of talent by a Henrietta Fitzwater to do this in what's been only around 20 to 25 minutes of green flag racing. Does the 61 have enough time? We've got around four laps to go at this point, and Kyle Collins is back into the race lead. Sam Curtis 
and Henry Williams both trying to make their respective charges, the 61 boxed in for now. Two and a half laps to go and a three wide battle for fourth place may have just confirmed these top three front runners their podium spots. The only thing left to determine it looks like is in what order. Kyle Collins a little sloppy through three and four. Henry Williams carries mo more momentum onto the front straight and gets the job done. Through turns one and two, Sam Curtis follows him through as well. A huge mistake there by Kyle Collins. I don't know whether he has enough time to go for another challenge, especially with Sam Curtis in his way. Does Curtis have anything for Henry Williams? He hasn't led any laps this race or this season to begin with, and it's a poor run through turns one and two. Williams opens up a two-car length gap as Kyle Collins desperately challenges Curtis on the inside, heading into three and four. Williams very close to that wall there. Curtis closes in off of the corner, lunges to the inside, but can't get the move to work. Henry Williams is your race winner. It's his first win of his career and an impressive one at that. He had only led a single lap before this race but managed to take the lead in the final two laps and hold it off with a, a veteran couple of laps there to defend some hard competitors. He's going to victory lane as he does a couple of victory laps for the fans here at Grand Detour. Sam Curtis with a strong runner-up position. Still no laps led this season, but uh, it can't go wrong with a second place. Kyle Collins. It's got to feel pretty gut-wrenching for him. He's gotten one of these taken away from him in the final laps yet again. It's got to be the fourth or fifth time this season where he's lost the lead in the final miles of an event. Jim Gambit finishes fourth in the number 44. He was pretty strong all day, led some laps earlier on. Well, Henrietta Fitzwater is the last car in the top five, climbing 36 positions to do so. Skyla Johnson rejoined the top 10 when it mattered and climbed all the way to sixth. Sidney Krasta finishes P7, Wisnowski in eighth, Pericles ninth, and Jerry Guerra, surprise, top 10. DJ Curtis managed to somewhat salvage things in the final few laps of his race, climbing into the top 20 when it counted, but the interval back to second has shrunk to its lowest point since Curtis took the championship lead after round 12 at Calder Park. Hurricane Michael Harvey's championship efforts are really building up strength as he could quite feasibly snap the lead away next round. The chaos that took place in race one is probably the only thing that protected Taylor Price from major losses as the 35 team still sits less than a round's worth of points off the championship lead. Skyla Johnson's chances have just been rejuvenated as she climbs up to fourth in the standings within the one round margin. The rest of the top 11 still have a shot as well, but need to hammer down consistently great performances to get there in time, while well, Prudence Little John on back are pretty much into the miracle territory. With three rounds to go, the field is split perfectly in two with only 42 drivers within mathematical contention. Cavalaris' DNF, albeit not his fault this time, have kept him drowning well below the rest of the backmarkers in the points. Next up, the series heads just east to Indiana for a pair of races at the Lucas Oil Raceway. This new addition to the schedule features progressive banking and will serve as the final short track, in fact, the final oval on the entire schedule. 